All right, hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, at this time, I'm gonna turn the floor over, say thank you and welcome to Charles Severance for joining us. Charles is with the University of Michigan School of Information, um, and he is going to share with us today connecting MOOCs and employment through open source projects. Thanks, Charles. Thank you, Kathy. Um, let me know if you don't hear me. So uh, this talk is, um, you, some of you have seen me give Sakai talks or Tsuki talks. This is a completely different talk. Um, and it's actually something that I've thought a whole bunch about um, because my, my day job or my other day job is teaching, um, teaching the world's largest um, online programming course. So this is a screenshot of the number of people who have looked at my course, who've enrolled in my course, who've done, made some progress in my course, and who've finished my course. I influence uh, 6,000 students every single week. I get an email that tells me that, and that is the first of uh, many courses, Python for Everybody, which is the world's most popular uh, and successful programming course. Uh, it's not that much farther ahead than the second most popular course, which I won't mention. So one of the things that I do um, that makes my course sort of more personable is I fly around the world. I haven't done it so much since COVID. I was in Kyoto. Uh, in uh, December 2019, and that was my last office hours. I, I had a new one in Valencia, Spain, just recently. And so, and I've done some online stuff, but the whole idea is that even though I have millions of students, I wanna make sure that uh, I can talk to them and listen to them. And so, um, so one of the things that we talk about in these office hours is like, why did you take a MOOC? What this, what this MOOC is for? And so I don't have any data, but I do have some solid anecdotal evidence that the 10 years of MOOCs has been amazingly successful for, for nearly all learners. I got a bunch of personas like, you know, young people before they go to college, um, moms and dads want their children to be really strong in college, so they come and take MOOCs, and it works out really well. College students who are often working in a curriculum that's a little bit sort of stodgy or out of date, love MOOCs. Sometimes they use them in the summer. Sometimes they'll take a hard class, but then they'll take a MOOC class. So it, it's really affected the 18 to 25 year old college students in a great way. And I got a, a tremendous number of stories of people in their kind of mid career where they've got a job, often in a company that uses technology, maybe not a technology company, but they learn while they're on the job and slowly but surely they find opportunities to sort of evolve in place. Or and then maybe they change a job. But the key to these people is that they're already working. They're already working in often a white collar kind of a job, you know, an office job. Maybe it's not a very inspiring one. And then they, they move. And then eventually they can move into a higher paying field where their, say, their programming skills are valued. This was the probably the best thing is uh, career promotion advancement for people with a degree, with a job in the field of their choice. And you take a Coursera course or a MOOC and you apply the skills almost immediately. And then eventually you're just promoted because of it. And it's just perfect on the job training and personnel development. Um, and then for a lot of people, no matter what their age, they just take MOOCs to uh, grow intellectually, to see something. The place where I talk to the most students, literally, is in the 18 to 30 year old students that are probably finishing high school, but never gonna go to college. Maybe they can't afford it, et cetera, et cetera. They're very motivated learners. They have lots of time to learn. They take a lot of MOOCs and they do quite well, except this is where MOOCs fail them. It is almost impossible to go and take a whole bunch of courses in programming and then go to get a programming job if you've never had a job. So I would say that this, after I feel really good about everything we've done in MOOCs for the past year, 10 years, but I really feel like we've let these people down. And so I have been throwing myself at this problem. Uh, I wrote a Quora article and you can see the Quora article here. The probably the most asked question is how do I get that first programming job? And this Quora article is very much some of what 
this is about. Um, it mostly talks about the problems and why it's so hard to get that first programming job. If you don't have an experience, any experience, especially demonstrable experience, a resume is just a bunch of words, and you say, I'm Java in your resume. What the heck does that mean? Now, if you have a portfolio or a GitHub, we, we, we students end up graduating with no portfolio or no GitHub, or if they do, they took a portfolio class and it's like, here is my website about flowers. And it's like, okay, that's your portfolio. Well, that makes you look worse rather than better. And, and there's no real evidence of people skills. Can you handle meetings? Can you handle deadlines? Can you work as part of a group? And honestly, group projects in college don't fix that problem. They actually make it worse because how we really work together in a group is very different than how group projects work. Certificates, everyone says certificates are the answer, not a degree. The problem is, is like, what if you have three certificates? Then you must not know anything. If you have 30 certificates, then you're a dork or a nerd, or just like maybe you just are unemployable and you just keep going to school. So certificates don't solve it. Certificates are great to add to a resume, but they're not a substitute. They've got no network of friends. Entry level jobs are often word of mouth. They're 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 not often posted because if you post an entry level Python job in my town, you will get hundreds, if not thousands, of applicants. If you post a senior level job, it's easier to to work through them. And you can't get recommendations. You know, as a teacher, students say, "Can you give me a recommendation for my job?" I took your class and I got an A, and I'm like, "I don't even remember you. How can I give you a, a recommendation?" So if you go to a really good college and pay, you know, $200,000 for a degree, we work very hard at places like the University of Michigan to get, make that job transition. We have job fairs. We have alumni networks. Our former graduates work at places. We give you practical project classes, although I'm kind of disappointed in these, mostly because the students often don't have the skill. We say, oh, you're a senior, and so you should be ready to do a capstone. And you took all these classes, and you should have all that knowledge in your head. Now you do the capstone, and then the first thing you notice in the capstone is, no, they don't know as much as the curriculum would suggest. People get internships at strong companies because of our school's connections. They learn people skills. They get real work product in their portfolio. And then most importantly, they get people who write real recommendations. And this works really well at large or prestigious schools. So, but there's not, everyone can go to a large or prestigious school and end up $200,000 in debt as a result. And so one of the things I've been doing in my MOOCs is I have been slowly but surely building a curriculum, not just one course, not just a Python course, but I have a Python course, a Django course, a PHP course, and a Postgres course. And I'm actually working right now on a C programming course not kind of a traditional one, but a historical perspective of how I can explain how Java works because I taught you C. So you can watch this degree emerging at online.drchuck.com. And so I'm trying to create not just a course, not just a specialization, not just a certificate, but a series of specializations that lead to what you might think of as a computer science degree. So the, at online.drchuck.com, I am going to, in the next few years, have built enough courses that I can, in a sense, give you a light computer science degree. Actually, not computer science as much as programming. This web -C, website at the Lower Cost Models for Independent Colleges Consortium, the LCMC, is something I've been working with these folks for a couple of years now. Um, it's led by uh, Adrian College in Adrian, in Adrian, Michigan, and we are building for liberal arts schools a computer science curriculum. Now, I, I begged them not to call it computer science. I begged them to call it programming, but they said, ah, oh, parents won't let their kids take a programming curriculum, so we'll just call it computer science, I say, but it's not going to be like computer science. It's about programming. And so if you look at the curriculum, this is um, there's about 40 liberal arts schools that are borrowing this curriculum and adopting this curriculum. If you look at it, it's exactly my MOOCs. And you can see I've got some of my MOOCs are done and some are not done. And I'm actually working on uh, CSM1, Introduction to C. So you can see all the things that I've got to build. I've got to build the rest of this curriculum over the next couple of years for these folks. But it's also the curriculum that I want to build. So they sort of adopted the curriculum that I suggested and, um, and then I'm building it.
Now, if you're a smaller school, like a liberal arts school, internships aren't as easy as a place like the University of Michigan. National companies like uh, Google and Amazon, they, they don't come to Adrian, right? They go to the big name schools. And if you wanna have a programmer that comes out of a small liberal arts school in rural Michigan, uh, it's difficult to find a company that's going to um, do an internship because these smaller companies find it difficult to do. And these capstone courses, you might have seen in that curriculum, got a capstone. They're kind of thin. I mean, every time I've ever worked with students in a capstone, um, they're only 15 weeks long. We have high expectations about student skills coming in because they're a senior, right? They should know something. And the answer is no, we sprinted through that material so fast the past three and a half years that these students have not retained it. So the first thing that a capstone needs to do is teach and then oops, there goes the 15 weeks. So like write a mobile application for virtual reality from scratch in 15 weeks and you don't even remember how to write Python. So, and the smaller the school, or the more local the school or the more diverse that school is, those students have jobs, they're part-time. The internships do not pay well, which requires you to have a wealthy mom or dad or both that will pay you to go to California and pay your rent all summer so that you can get a really cool thing and you can work full-time for a company who's barely going to pay you. And so if it's a diversity problem, right? A diversity and equity problem that these internships are only available to those who can afford to subsidize their own behavior inside the internships. So, ugh, not so good, right? Enter open source projects. So open source projects are worldwide. They're often staffed by part-time people. They always need more help, quality assurance, testing, documentation, curation and tracking of our issues, translation. We're short on staff. The senior people who are skilled are busy and don't really have time for mentoring of newcomers, which is unfortunately bad because then we can't expand our, you know, what we're doing um, as well. And, and so what, what do we do? And this is something we're starting to do in Sakai and getting better at all the time. And that is um, we've got to streamline onboarding. I would say we're only halfway there in Sakai. And so we've been thinking about what, it is so that we can bring new people into our community and not just super senior people. Um, senior people just like download the source code, figure it out, and off they go. So what we've done is we've come up with a task, and for Sakai it's quality assurance because quality assurance is easy to learn and it teaches you the product. And if you're going to be a contributor eventually in an open source project, you ought to actually know the product. And Sakai is a complex enough product that it's worthwhile to learn the product before you figure out how to contribute in other ways. So you got to make sure that onboarding is really, really smooth. Have a single web page. I want to actually also have a video that says, hi, you're new here. Welcome to the community. Here's what you're going to do, blah, blah, blah. Give them a checklist. Don't just give them a website with 12,000 pages that they can eventually read all 12,000 and figure it out. No, start them out with a very simple checklist and a contact of who to talk to when they get stuck. Invite them to meetings, get them on mailing lists, get the task that they're going to do well enough so that they can actually be con productive and contributing earlier, you know, and, uh, and make sure there's a person that will help them get unstuck if necessary. So this is our page, thanks to Will Mahajas, our community coordinator, that is, it, it, I wish that all of the Googles of getting started in Sakai would go here, all the searches, but they don't because getting started in Sakai has got a lot of user documentation and all kinds of other stuff that you see. But eventually we find our way here in one email message. We all know as a community that, that if we're creating a starting point of using it, adopting it, or helping to, to build it, we can... We should probably just make start.sakailms.org point to this <laughs> and redirect to it so we wouldn't have to have this long URL. But within that building Sakai, uh, we have that checklist. This is like, these are, you're going. we don't know what you're going to do, but welcome. Here's a quick list of the pointers, the common activities that you might want to get started, right? Join the mailing list, attend community meetings, get an account in our our, our, pre, our tracking. And th this is not all of it, but it's it's about not much bigger than this, right? It's it's something that gives the, the new community member something to do for a week or two, or they're just getting themselves started, right? And then we have, um, oh, how come this, oh, there it is, sorry. Um, 
And so one of the things we have in Sakai that makes it really great is we have uh, six or seven meetings every single week, right? And these are scheduled and there's humans. Sometimes there's 20 people in these meetings and sometimes there's three people in these meetings. But what's great is to get human contact, right? To get to the point where within the first week, your new community member is hearing people talk, right? Not just watching on email or downloading stuff or trying to make something work. So we have this core team meeting that is 10 o'clock every Tuesday and it's pretty well attended. And if you're new, uh, it's a great way to just sit and listen and get to know the people and get to find out about the commitment that people have to Sakai. And it helps new community members to place themselves in the Sakai activity. Um, and so uh, the other thing that, um, that I've been doing is I've been doing personal recruiting, both in my courses and in my MOOCs. And so I need a starting point. So this is, I add an email, right? And so this is, this is the thing that I send an email to a group of people that I'm trying to recruit. And this is kind of my, I, I know like for me, I need one a one page starting place. Like for this conference, I need to know, go to try Sakai and eventually with enough clicks, I'll find it, right? And so this is that kind of like, I can only remember one thing. And so when I send you email, it says I'm recruiting you to potentially be an intern with uh, Sakai or Sugi. Um, here is the required skills. There, there's a little more here. It's about twice as much as this. But the idea is, is that this is a single starting point if someone that you're recruiting can only find one thing, show them that one thing. Get them a very simple URL, a simple way to find their way to, so that when they see it go by and say, I'll come back to that in a week, they come back to it and they click on it and they got the information they need. Again, a website with thousands of web pages is not all that good for newcomers. It does nothing except drive those newcomers away and make it feel like they can't figure it out. So you got to get to the point where they can do something useful as fast as possible so they don't forget their little breadcrumbs that get them to the knowledge and information that they, uh, that they need. Oops. So this particular um, screen is an email that I sent. So I'm, I've got two sources of students. One source is the courses I teach at the University of Michigan, and the other is my MOOCs. Um, and right now, uh, the first place I really formally recruited was from the courses I teach. And I'll just read the first paragraph. Thanks for a great semester. If you recall, at the, this was after they'd taken my Django course. Thanks for a great semester. If you recall, at the beginning of the course, I told you I designed the course as if I were training you for a job working for me. I was only half kidding because I really would like to hire and pay a few of you to work this summer helping me with Sakai or other open source projects. And then I give that OSIS, open source internship uh, URL, and I talk a little bit about the details, and then I talk about how to apply for the job. So I, I only give the job application in the email. So I'm doing recruiting. Now I haven't done this in my MOOCs yet. I, I talk about it in my office hours and students who take my MOOCs uh, eventually take initiative and find their way to me and I recruit them slowly um, and I, I um, and so it, it uh, I, I haven't had an open call yet um, part of it is that I don't necessarily have a full curriculum to know what you know I, I want them to have taken a bunch of my classes and then I'm going to recruit them and so I, you know I, I haven't scaled up the uh, the MOOC recruiting yet so the one thing that um, that I think is important uh, for diversity and equity is um, to not limit. Uh, I do th so. First off, I think it's important to pay interns if you can afford it. And I'm talking a bit about uh, raising funds, etc. Um, so I want to pay folks. And one of the things that, because I teach in Coursera and I've got millions of students around the world, is I I think very much about. Um, solving problems globally, not just locally. And so one of the things I've been passionate about doing, and I luckily have the funds in my learning experiences company to do a little bit of this, is I am paying my interns. I'm paying my University of Michigan interns with the University of Michigan funds I have, and I'm paying my international interns 
uh, from my own company. Uh, that doesn't scale. I can't do thousands and thousands of people, but there is money. And sometimes you can, internships don't have to, especially if they're remote, you don't have to move. They're not full time. But you can have a relatively small amount of money that can make a big difference. If, if an internship is a purely voluntary thing and there's a little bit of like headwind and it's a little difficult, well, and people will not work very hard and then they'll they'll ghost out on you after two weeks, right? But if there's the potential for pay, sometimes you want to make it so that you've got to wait a month or two and then you start paying them just to see if they're going to ghost out on you anyways. But I just want to share something. It took me a lot to figure this out. My first MOOC intern is from India and uh, he's awesome. He's helped me figure out what it, what it means to hire uh, someone from India. But at this point, I could hire someone from you know, Sub-Saharan Africa. I could hire someone from just about anywhere. This gusto.com. I just love them and there's other companies like it, but we look through a bunch of them and I just want to tell you that if you have this urge to pay somebody from an emerging economy, uh, you can do that and you can do that through gusto.com and it's surprisingly inexpensive and they take care of what would be your 1099 or the taxes in each country. They take care of talking to your, your intern to figure out what, what tax info they need in each country and they move the money around and get it into their account. And you don't even have to see their account. You just send money to Gusto and then Gusto puts it in their account. And so paying interns to do open source work that saves you money. It's less expensive than full-time employees and it's a great benefit to them and it really bonds everybody together when there's money going on. So, so it's early days. I mean, I admit this. I only have two of them, two interns, one paid intern from the University of Michigan and one paid intern from a MOOC course contact. I mean, it's going really, really well. And and we're using QA and other things. Um, and each for now, each intern I hire, I tell them to help me make the process better. So um, I have big dreams and I have big goals and I'm just sharing with you sort of like why I'm working on this, what, what the gap, and I see this both as a gap in open source and I see this as a gap in MOOCs. I, I really want to get over the next year or so to the point where I can have ongoing at all times five to ten interns working on Sakai all the time and have them paid, right? And what I'm here at the Aperio, Open Aperio conference is to liaise with other open source projects. To, to generalize this approach. Just because I can make it work with my particular learning experiences company. Somewhere on here is learning experiences. Oh, I guess not. And I can, I have the money I have, I can do it and I have some University of Michigan money and so on. everything is unique in a context. But I'd like to generalize this approach and have a better understanding. And if this becomes a multi-project effort and it's running smoothly and I would like to see us go raise some funds, right? Raise some funds from nonprofits to say, look, if you just drop us a million bucks a year, we can run in effect something like a Google Summer of Code worldwide across multiple projects. And I could imagine that the benefit of that would be great because we would be touching uh, a whole series of emerging economies uh, with a very uh, great e improvement of uh, the job prospects of all these students after they learned all this stuff in low cost educational experiences. And I think that is the end of my talk. Um, and so I don't know how much time we have. I hope I didn't go over. I don't think I did. Um, but I will, uh, I'll pause and check the chat and see if there are any questions. Um, yeah, Andrew, I completely agree with you that uh, these computer science students are underutilized. We're not, and, and, and we're not doing any favors either to those who might utilize them or the students themselves, right? I mean, we have, we have interacted in Sakai with a series of senior capstone groups, and I think they've just been generally a disaster, right? And that's because we, we think that they're computer science seniors, which means they should be able to do anything a computer scientist with a few years of experience can do. And they can't. They just can't. And so, and 15 weeks is too short. And, and so these poor students, they end up with a terrible experience because they disappoint themselves. And, um, you know, so yeah, take a boot camp, join an open source project. I like it.
Yeah. And, and again, as a teacher, I just love the idea of once I've turned in the final grades of going and recruiting the students, because at least I know what I sort of taught them. And it doesn't have to be, I mean, I'm not teaching classes that are technical enough to make you ready to work in Sakai as a core developer, but I had to teach it so that you can really be great at QA in Sakai. By the time you teach a, take a Python class and a Django class, you are quite ready to, uh, so. Yeah. Um, so if someone has got me a private chat that says, once I've gone through your MOOCs and would like to intern free as part of the team, reason being we use Sakai in our university, you know how more, how, how more the back end is I'm carrying on the front end support team. Yeah, and I think that, um, so, so another talk that you should have not done my talk, but you should have gone to this talk instead, as Didi Horikin at Marist, and um, they, she has a funding source, which I think is work study for international students, and she uses that to, to fund QA. And the, the key thing that, that we're working together on is making it so that this QA activity, which is extremely important for open source projects, um, is uh, a, a, st a starting point right, a place to start growing and a place to start being involved. And then depending on the skills as everyone's, as students' skills grow, they can do more and more. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, can I talk for a sec? Yep. Oh, uh, hi, hi, Jack. Thank you so much for raising those important points. And uh, again, we, I mean, you voiced what's been on our, like in our heads and our brains for like many, many years uh, about our, uh, our students and indeed competitiveness of all, all, like of each college depends on like what career services it can offer to students also. And again, many bright kids go through our schools and uh, we would love to, you know, involve them, um, involve them in open source, make them, you know, a nice addition to the portfolio because again, just as I was starting in this country 20 years ago, and I didn't go to um, school in, in the United States. I, I got a degree overseas. I got to that, um, again, it was uh, right after the year 2000. I got this uh, problem that everyone wanted you to be like very young, but also have like 20 plus years of experience. And, you know, you got to start somewhere. And with the students, uh, they ask, yeah, I'm done with college. Uh, I'm lucky if I have good internship and uh, build up. But there are so many students who don't go through that uh, path. And again, as uh, um, my um, understanding was like, again, you, you just voiced it, that I've been telling everyone that college, like in the semester of the course, college cannot produce uh, like proper computer programmer. You gotta be, you gotta do so much, so much, uh, so much uh, independent work. I mean, you, you have to invest in yourself and you know, college, you have like what, four or five other courses. Every instructor, professor uh, requires you to do all sorts of things uh, during the semester. So it's uh, it's nice foundation, uh, but you have to build on that foundation. And that's, I mean, I, I happened to, to teach a course and I came to the classroom, I told them, listen, I have bad news for you. My my, my belief was that you cannot become a programmer in 15, 15 week course. So, but I'll try to, uh, you know, prove opposite by, by, by teaching you. Uh, so, so, so yeah. Um, if, if we, we develop, even with with Aperia, uh, there are so many open source projects. We can put together uh, some some courses that we, you know, uh, involve students. Uh, GitHub contribute, uh, uh, and again, it, it, it benefits open source community and benefits the students with their portfolio, get them started on a proper path. And so, yeah, thanks for mentioning those uh, internships and and ways to pay, and uh, it's very important for them. Thank so, you. Andre. Uh, Andre, you, Andre, you, uh, you just give a sh gave a short version of exactly my talk. We agree completely. I put a thing in the chat, uh, a podcast by a fellow named David Bomble, and he's he's you know talks about programming a lot. And the title of the podcast was uh, "Computer Science Is Not Programming," and we talked for an hour and a half about that exact topic that you just touched on, and that is that you don't graduate from a computer science school as a master programmer, and there are different skills. And that's sort of what we're working on um, 